Chapter 3 A Miracle for Breakfast And what you thought you came for is only a shell, a husk of meaning, from which the purpose breaks only when it is fulfilled, if at all. Either you had no purpose, or the purpose is beyond the end you figured and is altered in fulfillment. T.S. Eliot The search for purpose is a powerful driving force in everyone's life. This is especially true with regard to our central motivating purposes, although it is equally gratifying to discover meaning within the propelling events of life. We ardently want to know whether the coincidences which occur in our lives happen by random chance or by divine orchestration. The key to understanding purpose, however, lies not in anticipating events, seeking them, or avoiding them. For, indeed, if our lives are divinely guided to do a particular work, then the events are destined to find us, regardless of our expectations or explanations. I have discovered that peace of mind comes from surrendering to such points of destiny. If and when there is enough insight to see the interwoven threads of life, then an integrated whole may be revealed to us. When that happens, life makes satisfying sense and brings into focus a fulfilling recognition of vital purpose. No sooner had the finished painting provided me with feelings of contentment and sufficiency than it plunged me into a greater unknown. As I sat before it, reverently remembering the pleasure of his company, a mixture of tears and smiles filled my countenance. Mainly, however, I felt confusion and concern, old familiar feelings I had not known since before the visitation. Why? For what purpose has this come to be? These were questions I directed toward the master's portrayal which was now on our living room wall. I missed him deeply. Though his love was lingering everywhere like the fragrance of clean mountain air. Within a few days, however, my heart was filled again with the soothing resonance which I recognized as his presence. A new dimension of our relationship had begun along with a new and deeper means of communing Though no words were spoken, my questions could now be answered. I felt him say with unmistakable grace, give it to my people. He had answered my question, but with no clues of how to proceed. Moreover, his request was more easily made than done. His people are everywhere. They come in every color, nationality, and heritage. Within the Christian community, there are countless creeds and hundreds of church denominations. Many of his most devoted students and disciples do not participate in any religious structure at all. And well beyond the boundaries of what we call Christianity, his teachings are an influence around the world. Where was I to begin? The obvious answer was anywhere. With simple, contagious enthusiasm, word began to spread from us to others. Soon strangers from across the country would be arriving on our doorstep unannounced, asking to view this painting of Jesus. It is staggering to imagine how many barriers had to come down and how many inhibitions had to be suspended in order for such a thing to happen. People became a living miracle as they sought and experienced his presence in the painting. As visitors carried back reports of excitement to their groups and churches, invitations began to pour in for us to share the painting through outreach. As with people, so too the denominational walls came tumbling down. In the next two years, we gave our best effort by traveling across five states to more than 80 churches and most denominations. Protestant, Catholic, Charismatic, Episcopal, 
even Cowboys for Christ. Reaching well beyond the walls of church dominion, we went wherever we were called. As we shared the painting, miracles followed upon miracles. That was a new dimension of growth and life experience for me. There was no way of explaining or expecting the miracles that might occur. They came simply as gifts to those who received or witnessed them. If there is anything more elusive than the subject of purpose, it would be the one of miracles, that special realm of higher purpose which laces our life with golden thread. Moreover, it seems as if there is no order of importance in the realm of miracles, for each one represents a moment of consummate grace upon the earth. So, how does one comprehend the miraculous or recognize its approach? Rarely do we anticipate the miracles which change our lives, for they simply arrive at the most marvelous of surprises. It is easy for me now to cast a backward glance upon the trail of miracles left by the master through his painting and feel the tranquil pleasure that such memories bring. However, the birthing of a miracle is often as painful as the birthing of a child, for new life must rip the veil of existing structure if it would declare its presence. Though love, life, and growth are like the mighty forces of an ocean, even they could be more easily harnessed than the power of love at the master's command. Complacency, reservation, and conservatism are not words that leap to mind when I think of his influence on my life. In those days of discovery and growth after the painting's completion, my relationship with him continued to emerge with transforming grace. Like tulips pushing through earth in spring. Along with that came greater attainments of truth, more fully integrated with life and more applicable to it. Eventually, I came to realize that miracles are just the power of growth as love and life push through the veils of illusion that hold them back. If one focuses on the impact of love and its capacity to bring miracles into being, then they become an expected part of life. If one focuses on the structures that deny the greater power of love and life, then an emerging miracle may erupt with startling surprise. So accustomed are we to smiling in the face of a miracle that we often fail to consider that it might have been prefaced by elements of danger or trauma. Events of those two years should have taught me something about the bittersweet flavor of miracles. It seems, however, that a full understanding of that reality never seems to come until one is at peace with the holistic nature of life. In the summer of 1992, I was given further instruction in that school of thought. What I would have given for a higher level of understanding on that morning of July 20th. I could have enjoyed my breakfast with peaceful anticipation instead of dwelling in a state of frozen turbulence, stunned by a terrible surprise which offered no promise of resolution. Little did I know that I was enduring the labor pains of a new birthing miracle, the most significant one for me since the master's entry into my life. My ordeal had begun the day before. July 19, 1992 began as a typical Sunday for us. As soon as breakfast was over, Brian loaded the painting in our station wagon while I dressed and reviewed the notes for my morning presentation. This time, we were traveling to St. Francis of Assisi Episcopal Church in Willow Park, Texas. Father Herman, the pastor, had heard of the Lamb and the Lion and asked us to present it to his congregation and tell the story of how it came to be. On our arrival, Father Herman and several of the parishioners were waiting to help us install the painting in the fellowship hall. No sooner had we set it up than a tragedy struck. A floodlight fell from its tall tripod, crashing into the canvas. Several people watched helplessly as the light plummeted to the floor. 
One woman, Judy Herber, dove to the floor to deflect the heavy fixture, but she failed to reach it in time. The light crashed into the left side of the, fan, the painting, landing right in the split trunk of the old oak tree. As we straightened the painting and rebalanced it on the easel, everyone present observed the extent of its damage, a four inch dent in the canvas with a one inch tear at its center. I passed my finger completely through the incision. Being an art historian and past museum professional, I knew what options existed for repairing a painting damage to that degree. The dent would always protrude, and though the tear could be patched and inpainted, its presence still would be noticeable to anyone who looked for it. Unfortunately, there's not much difference between a torn canvas and Humpty Dumpty. You can put the pieces together, but they'll never be whole again. From where does the strength come to continue when everything inside says quit? Fortunately, there are more dimensions to our strength than we normally use, and that Sunday, I discovered my extra reserves. The painting would be far enough away from the congregation that I would not have to discuss the tragedy with anyone who did not already know about it. With trembling hands and shallow breath, I began to speak. I was scheduled for a morning presentation before Mass and then an afternoon discussion with Open House. Somehow I got through the day. Benevolently, one of the blessings of shock is the anesthesia it brings. Late that afternoon, we carefully placed the painting in its case, hoping to avoid any further damage and silently drove home. I wanted to pray, but for the life of me, there were no words for what I felt. The next morning I woke up with a sense of dread. Every moment that I forestalled the inevitable was a salve to my nerves. That morning required a full pot of coffee. Sitting alone, I tried not to look at the large picture case leaning against the living room wall. Memories washed across my consciousness as I recalled the events and miracles all leading to this morning. Between the tears, I found myself asking, why? The answer came quickly enough. As soon as I could muster the strength, my first duty was to examine the painting and estimate its damage. My second duty was to contact a conservation studio. The canvas could never be made whole by any human means, but it could be made cosmetically presentable and professional restoration would prevent further deterioration at the point of rupture. As I carefully glided the painting from its case, there was no way of preparing myself for what was about to be revealed. The injury was gone. I cautiously ran my fingers across the surface, carefully examining the area that had only been torn yesterday. There was only perfection, no dent, no cut, no loss of paint. Flipping the painting over to its backside, the weave of canvas presented itself with a countenance as tight and strong as the day it was stretched. Holding it up to the window, I could see no pinholes of light, nor even a fleck of paint missing. Examination of the backside through high magnification revealed that not so much as a fiber was torn. What happened to me at that moment was almost as disturbing as the original injury. My expectations had been completely dismantled. As structure revealed its illusional nature, I was shaken to the core. With a mixture of emotions impossible to describe, I looked at the split oak tree in humbled amazement and remembered the day I asked Jesus if it had to be that way. Soon shock gave way to thrill and my urge to share was overwhelming. Brian was gone for the day, so the first person I telephoned was Judy Huber. Together we went over the events of the last two days time and again, confirming the experience we had shared. As soon as we could break away from our choruses of praise and squeal, Judy relayed the news to Father Herman. In a calm, expectant voice, he remarked, I am not surprised. I prayed for it all night. 
About a week later, everyone who had witnessed the incident met at the church to examine the painting and celebrate its healing. Each brought his own written account of the damage he had seen. St. Francis Church retained their letters, unmitigated testaments to what happened there on July 19th. It's a good thing that confirmation exists, for the painting itself shows no sign, even under intense magnification, of ever being dented, abraded, or torn in any way, and most certainly not repaired. In the following weeks and months, I had to clarify this experience through seeking greater understanding, for inquiries about it would not cease. Even so, the miraculous cannot be figured out in the normal way, because the logic we use to explain our reality is endlessly conditioned by predictable patterns of cause and effect. Such thinking could never comprehend a miracle, much less explain one. There is a strange aspect to the way I remember the event, almost as if there were two sets of experiences symmetrically connected on different dimensions of reality, delicately separated by the thinnest veil. On one side of the veil, the one supported by physical perception, I can recount in vivid detail every moment of the shocking event on that Sunday. No doubt my recollections would closely agree with those of other witnesses. On the other side of the veil, however, there exists an expanded consciousness which retained a perception of the painting's wholeness despite the assault. It seems as though my normal perceptions of reality, which extend horizontally, had been intersected by a vertical insertion of a higher truth and power. Such thoughts cause me to wonder if perhaps the whole of universal reality performs its endless creation around the intersection of timeless moments where horizontal plausibilities cross in perfect harmony with the vertical possibilities for ascending or descending consciousness. Is it possible that the duality around which we build our lives is like the split oak tree? Could it be that Jesus' whole mission on earth was to show us that while duality exists, there is greater wholeness which reduces it to mere illusion? In our lives, there are crowning moments, but there is also hardship. We know pain all too well, and yet there is perfection coexisting with it. As I look back over my life, there is this kind of complexity through it all yet simplicity as well. Will there suddenly be a moment when we finally decide to disallow imperfection the dominant influence it has now? Or could it be that nothing but wholeness ever does prevail once we are willing to perceive it? Perhaps that is the key to his message and the mystery.